Welcome to the panel, the first this afternoon, on yet another provocative take on uh, grassroots organizing. Transgender disidentifications and social movement solidarities. A special volume on the journal, Social Justice, examines the processes by which immigrants, primarily Latino immigrants, become cast as lawbreakers and criminals by the US state and media institutions. And simultaneously, how Latinos as a social body become synonymous with illegality. Significantly, the work in this volume draws an important corollary between the development of the US prison industrial complex and the recent proliferation of immigrant detention centers. This have challenged mainstream immigrant rights organizations that struggle primarily on behalf of immigrants who fit the well-deserving law-abiding and citizen-ascribing mold, primarily because its logic supports the dictates of state power and repression. They have used tactics and strategies, including engaging in public protests, civil disobedience, and direct action. Through these activities, they have taken on the social body of the, quote, lawbreaker by putting themselves in the place of their parents. So I'll read uh, one quote by one of the undocumented <coughs> activists and, and come to a conclusion. Quote, we want to step away from the DREAM Act. Not step away, but go beyond it, right? When we fight for the DREAM Act, we set the groundwork for the current work that we are doing. But we are running into people that don't want to do something outside of what a dreamer is. People don't want to fight for people who are not DREAM Act eligible. And so we want to go beyond that and really fight for all undocumented people. We've been focusing on stopping deportations, and focusing on the criminalization of immigrants and people of color. Essential to our work is helping people lose that fear or overcome that fear of either immigration, ICE, police, so that we can liberate ourselves. The struggle by undocu-queer organizers have been fraught with tensions and challenges. Many of these youth face alienation and ostracization, first from their families that they are born into and then from the communities they belong to and from organizations that they join. Regardless uh, of their sacrifices, un undocu-queer activists seek to rupture the logic of the rightful and deserving citizen because of its privileging of white male heterosexual citizenry, which suppresses and denies others from enjoying their fullest expressions as human beings. Through their identification as being undocu-queer, activists challenge the notion of criminality, citizenship, and human worth. Thank you. I want to thank Irene, the department, and all the conference organizers who put this together. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about, if you can put the UNM PowerPoint. Most of us um, met through the DREAM work and, and organizing for the DREAM Act and through this um, fight for access to higher education. And, and in 2010, you saw like a large mobilization of, of youth who were coming together and uh, going from rally to rally, you just you start to see people um, on a daily basis, and then you start to talk with one another and and realize that you you also a part of the same family, right? The LGBT community, and and it feels welcoming because for so long you you feel like you're the only person going through the struggle of, of dealing with your sexuality and having um, to live your life here as an undocumented person. So recently in, in this year, like we've really been making a push to to really develop what it means to be undocu queer and what how do we how do we sh um, share our lives with other people and get them to understand what we're living and so we've been uh, working with several different groups and I'm sure all of you know of Julio Sagala's work and he's been really helpful and and putting prints out there and sharing. His projects, and one of them is the I'm on Docu Queer uh, print study created, and a lot of the people in this room are part of that project. And it's a really simple project, right? He's just drawing you, and you uh, share a little quote about what it means to live in this country being undocumented and queer. And it, it's gotten a lot of attention. I think it's one of the main um, visuals that we have out there that people recognize. Um, and so using art as a way to to share our stories, right? Um, and then just getting more publicity online. And when I mentioned about developing, you know, this theory, uh, we are currently um, creating a project where we're uh, get, gathering stories across the country of undocumented queer people and really putting them in a text and have it 
be accessible for people across the country because as we know as people of color there's not really a lot of things that we can google to find out about our history right um there's often this perspective that uh given that we don't uh, identify with or we didn't live so we don't know how to connect with what is out there and so we are being really intentional intentional of creating our own stories our own history and documenting it to have it um as as time goes on and we kind of move away from this mess that we're in having to to live like this kind of hustle and grind life your whole life and seeing your parents live that um you know you try to get through life uh day by day and and as you do and then you become comfortable with your sexuality and your immigration status you just learn to deal with it right and you stay busy but then there's like that one day where like things hit the fan and you like you know this country puts you in check and like no this is really what your life is here and just working with uh both communities to really bridge this gap that that we see um on a daily basis and being really active and doing that um on the ground and hoping we can someday you know see this change that we're working to see you know immigration and I being a dreamer you know which I uh, with the dreamer you know you you the, it, saying you're a dreamer right which people uh, like like to say it um we like to say well we're undocumented but um everywhere you go it's like oh so you're a dreamer just because of your age and maybe because you know English and you're going to school they just throw that at you also oh, you're a dreamer it's like oh, I'm undocumented you know uh, and they just kind of group everybody with this dreamer mentality and coming with that it comes with this uh notion of like oh they're well educated and all these other things right and they're good dreamers and you know, four years. Uh, dreamers all across the country. You know, in 2008, um, they uh, they went out. You know, undocumented youth and uh, were you know fighting to get Obama elected in, in a lot of bad, battleground states: Colorado, uh, Florida, um, Nevada, and many other states. Um, you know, dreamers were out there undocumented youth and the undocumented community fighting for Obama to get elected. And then when um, when Obama went in, uh, you know, we all what we saw to the end was well, 1.5 million deportations. Um, and what undocumented youth all across the country were saying, hey, you know, well, um, we need uh, we need relief, right, for undocumented youth. Um, and so uh, uh, we had been, you know, fighting for two years for some sort of relief. And the administration had said, uh, they just said, no, they can't do it. And then uh, one of the uh, actions that finally towards the end, um, uh, at, like in June, uh, the National American Youth Alliance uh, uh, started a campaign where we... Um, we were saying, well, we're going to take over your offices, your campaign offices in battleground states until you do something, until you actually do something about it. So we were in Denver. Um, so I, uh, the, we did the hunger strike. We actually went inside the office in Denver, right? Uh, and uh, we shut down the office for six days. We were in a hunger strike. And then from there followed uh, Michigan, um, California, and I forget. Ohio. There was, Ohio sorry, yeah, Ohio. And Georgia... Georgia, I believe, uh, was also uh, doing actions around o OFA as well. But when we talk about, you know, uh, I like being undocumented and queer and what we're doing as well, and then we start realizing that um, all movements are interconnected, right, within our communities. So um, we have to ask, you know, we're not single issue dreamers. So um, although, you know, uh, like within your community, you always find that there's there's battles, you know, even in your in your cities. Uh, the police department, um, they're trying to they were trying to pass measures. Um, so that they can get more power and start being able to have more checkpoints, to have more power to um, detain people and be able uh, and be able to either you know just detain them or send them over to the sheriff's department, which in turn would you know would mean deportation for some of these people. Um, so they're trying to pass these measures, and we found ourselves also fighting against these measures. Um, and so what we were um, saying is, well, like, uh, like organizing is not just we can't live single issue lives because if we do, then we're going to be stuck in um, one, uh, you know, fighting for one legislation or fighting for one political party or fighting for one city council member, et cetera, uh, and not realizing that it's all interconnected. We're helping two out of three council members, um, our council members, and we were fighting like sixty, seventy thousand dollars when the people that we were running were like five, six, seven thousand dollars. And we ended up winning two out of the three seats. The police department uh, spent over fifty thousand dollars on their measure. Uh, we only spent about two thousand and we ended up defeating that measure as well. So I get a lot of negative, you know, energy because that I'm not doing some, like a lot of stuff nationally or I'm not doing, you know, certain things. And it's like, well, you know, I'm focused on my community because we always say, an you know, the best, uh, the safest community is an organized community. It's like, well, I'm organizing in my community uh, and, and um, we have a lot in the empire. We have 
anti-immigrant legislators. We have Minutemen. We have the KKK has the biggest um, chapter in the Southwest in the Inland Empire. So it's like when um, we are fighting, you know, a lot. So it's like once we get it together, which, you know, I mean, we're fighting against big numbers, big money. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very hard, right? So for me, it's like, well, I mean, as long as I continue to organize within my community, I'm only accountable to my community, and I continue to organize within my community, which is an empire. My name is Alex Aldana. I'm also, uh, well, I was born and raised in uh, Guadalajara, Mexico. So unlike my fellow um, compadres, um, I don't have that privilege of being raised uh, with the American culture as, as a youngster. So I migrated here when I was 16, which makes me uh, unqualified for uh, the fraction. Coming from a farm working family and also a domestic violence survival family, um, making intersectionalities was uh, something that I lived by every day, you know, that I couldn't identify with. Going to school, I don't have the privilege, I don't have a degree. Um, I was uh, privileged enough to graduate from high school. Um, I never had that opportunity. Um, part of my organizing comes from uh, what, I, what I call the true school, which is the community. Um, you know, I organize with uh, the LGBT, uh, HIV prevention communities. Uh, I was really involved with uh, farm working rights. Um, I mentor LGBT youth. Um, as I moved to LA to, to approach higher everything, right? Uh, job, education, um, activism. So I started in Pomona and this is where I met these two fellows. <laughs> and so I organized around um, seven LGBT youth centers. And um, it was really empowering to me to see these folks come out of the shadows because I was myself. Mm -hmm. Once you jump into the nonprofit complex, um, you know, jobs, you realize that you can't lose your job or you can come out of the shadows because you have a job, you have a title. So I joined uh, full on the Immigrant Youth Coalition, uh, the Campaign for an American Dream. We did a walk across the country. And, uh, and it's, very, it's been really crucial to be part of this um, Docu Queer Collective because we're not only um, doing immigration work and we're not only talking about identities as a political tool, we're tired of being put down in the shadows by the heteronormative um, allies that tell us that, you know, like, oh, like, queer stuff is not, it doesn't belong here. We, we shouldn't be talking about this. There is an LGBT research center for you. You know, so it's really, it's, it, it got me really, really um, bad because that's the work that I did, you know, and I never, I never interconnected those struggles within my clients, knowing that a lot of folks were, I organized with Victoria uh, as I got first hired, you know, I didn't realize that people were dying in detention centers. So the media obviously doesn't express those things, right? They don't talk about all the, uh, the people that have passed away because of all these anti-immigrant homophobic laws that we have in place in the country. So um, I was lucky to, to come across the Centro de Derechos in Encuentro and they, uh, they received me with open arms to, to talk about these issues because they work with a very special community which is monolingual, unprivileged uh, Latino community and, and to have those intersections and be really open about this that that if I come to a dream team at a university the first thing that we face is language barrier right uh, if my dad or my mom were to come to a dream team to talk about the dream act first of all they will have a better identifying with a dreamer and that's what a lot of people ask me with like I actually had the first time the first week that I got here I got an interview I was in some event and um, they asked me if I was a dreamer, and I mentioned the word undocumented, and they, they backed up a little bit, and they're like, what do you mean? And I was like, yeah, that's who I am. You know, I'm not a dreamer, I'm a realist, and I realized I don't qualify for the dream act. You know? <laughs> when you break a role of being the good dreamer, you know, a lot of people turn your back, or their backs on you, and it was really crucial to have, when we talk about the Ndoku Queer Collective New Mexico, we talk about accountability. That's one of the things that, that we learn as a collective, that we realize that we have to keep our minds out of those sectors, out of those organizations that tell us that, that you're limited to do something because our curriculum doesn't allow to do this. Or they're on, oh, wait a minute, but you're queer, you're here, you're, we don't allow that, you shouldn't be at the forefront. Our communities continue to be targeted, our communities continue to be deported and to be abused by these people, for example. So we don't, we cannot, and we will no longer have that privilege to remain within one organization. So what the Undocu Queer Collective offers here in New Mexico, it's a space where where all of us can work together for something greater than than just the curriculum. We also had a, um, 
a drag show benefit where we're, we were not only talking about being queer and undocumented, but breaking the, the machista normative expectation of the, the gay Latino men, right? That, that if you become a drag queen, like you become something less. So just having all these conversations are very intentional. The spaces that we're having them are very intentional. We're also tired of that. We have the power to, to make it upon ourselves to get these people out of the detention centers. We have, regardless of being uh, having papers or not, we can go to our legislatures and tell them, you know, we, we're tired of all these laws and make our voices be heard. Just... Yeah, people want to deport you back home or they want to send you to hell, right? So those are the two options that we have. <laughs> Talking to these folks, saying like, so how do you feel about uh, undocumented immigrants? Oh, yeah, the, the, the lottery, you know, the licenses. So how do you feel about equality with to the LGBT community? Oh, no, they, they shouldn't get married, you know? And I'm just like, how can we have an open conversation and to to abolish these barriers that we have, you know? So I was there putting my story out there as I'm always telling all the folks that are part of the Queer Collective, you know, we should, like, really, if we say that we're undocumented and unafraid, queer and unashamed, we should truly mean it and engage in these conversations every time because we cannot afford to just be like, oh, yeah, I'm a dreamer, but I'm in the closet, you know? So that's uh, that's something that that diminishes the communication amongst our communities. And, and it was really powerful to see their responses because they... You know, words like illegal, and thank you for um, the Diana that mentioned. That's something that, yes, we're trying to get that rid of that word, but we're pissed off. We're tired of people, you know, deporting our families, separating families. We're tired of all those homophobics, you know, like telling us faggots, you know, telling us to go to hell, that we don't deserve the humanizing us, you know, telling us that we're less than.